far has been really mind shifting to also get the entrepreneurial view. We are live now on YouTube. People are tuning in. I know IQM has been posting it. They have the live stream, others, and we look forward to the audience in Zoom and on the YouTube channel. Lindsay, you will start opening the, the waiting room and Prachi and Ethan are ready to get it started. Perfect. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our special session today. Many of you have started your quantum journeys already and you're asking the question, what next? To help you give you an idea of what impact you can make in the quantum field, today we have an amazing set of panelists. But before we introduce you to them, I want to introduce you to one of the people that actually started this quantum journey at a very, very young age, maybe younger than all of us combined, and that's Ethan Hansen. Ethan is a, is a rising sophomore. He's interning with Zapata this summer and last summer too. And more than anything, he's taken his quantum uh, excitement into his own quantum journey and entrepreneurial start where he has a podcast called Quantum Computing Now. It's an amazing podcast that talks about what's happening in the quantum field. He's interviewed many amazing CEOs before as well. And it's one podcast you can go to find all the news and interesting facts about quantum computing. So thank you, Ethan, for leading the panel today and over to you. Yeah, thanks, Praji. Happy to be here. And yeah, like Prabhu said, I'm the host of Quantum Computing Now. Um, and yeah, it's my, my privilege to be here in front of all of you. This is my first time actually hosting a panel. So uh, go easy on me. Um, I have, I've run podcasts before, but I've never you know, been in charge of this many people. So we're going to see how this goes. Um, I'm actually going to let each of the individual panelists introduce themselves. Um, so we're going to get started right away with everyone giving a little bit of a, like a quick background on who you are uh, and why you're on this panel. So focus on your entrepreneurship experience. Um, Jan, let's start with you. All right. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for giving us the opportunity here and, and hello to everyone listening in or in, in, in watching this. Uh, my name is Jan Götz. I'm one of the founders of IQM, uh, which is a company that builds quantum computer. Uh, so we build complete systems based on the superconducting technology. And I guess like most uh, quantum startup founders, uh, I have a scientific background. So I made the transition from academia into entrepreneurship. Um, so I did a PhD in the field, then I did a postdoc. And at some point I realized, or we, the founding team realized that if you really want to build large scale systems, actually it's not going to happen in the future in, on the academic side. I think the universities are great and super important still part of the ecosystem um, to make scientific breakthroughs, which is what we still need. But if it's about systems engineering and, and scaling it up, this is more a job for industry. And um, being located in Europe, so I did my PhD in Munich, then I was in, in Helsinki where I'm, I still am. Um, we, we don't have so, so many choices to join companies like Google, IBM or other of the big established ones. So in sense if you want to do it in an industrial background you have to start a company there's no no alternative so this is what we did uh, planning it in, in 2018 then we got the first funding round to uh, 2019 so this is now pretty much three years ago and and since then yeah we are running or uh, the, the company which is at the moment uh, approaching 200 people so it has grown quite quite fast um, over the last few years it's an exciting journey um, and i'm happy to share a few more thoughts then later during this panel yeah thanks jan um, amir over to you yeah, so uh, thank you, Ethan. Also, um, it's a, a good opportunity to say uh, that uh, I'm an avid listener of the podcast. I was even fortunate enough to be a guest. So uh, for everyone who didn't have the chance, that's uh, really recommended. Um, my name is Amir. Uh, I'm uh, based in, uh, so I'm living in Israel. Um, the company I founded, co-founded two years ago, Classic, uh, was founded in 2020, based in Israel, uh, I'm the vice president of product uh, at Classic. Um, so Classic, in the past two years, uh, we, we've raised $63 million um, and we're now a team of 50 quantum software engineers, one of the largest teams of uh, people that are both experts in quantum, but also experts in software engineering and, and building a product. And the company is focused on building the technologies that enable designing quantum algorithms at scale. So we're in the very, very early days of quantum computing. I know a lot of you have had the chance to work a little bit on quantum software and quantum algorithms. And 
uh, it's, it's possible, uh, although challenging to build uh, small circuits on 10 or 20 qubits, but when you're going into large circuits, you encounter uh, challenges that need to be solved by technology and not by um, you know, uh, uh, talented individuals that are kind of working at the gate level. Um, so, so that's uh, the challenge the company has took uh, upon itself. Um, before Classic, I was uh, leading projects and teams in the Israeli defense and intelligence communities. Um, Israel um, is, uh, yeah, is, is quite of a, a nation that's known for entrepreneurship and, and building companies, um, sometimes not as good as growing them to scale, uh, I hope will be different in that sense. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure being here and I hope to share some of the insights. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amir. And Corbin, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much both to the Womonium team for setting this up and Ethan for hosting. I'm also a longtime listener of your podcast and have gotten a lot out of it. So um, thanks and keep it up. Um, my background is actually really different from the others on the panel. I'm not a PhD. I don't have a background in physics or computer science. Um, in fact, before launching Maybell, I spent 10 years as a strategy, strategy consultant at the Boston Consulting Group. Um, so I studied mechanical engineering at the Air Force Academy Economics at Hopkins. And um, my path to quantum, however, came through the work I was doing at BCG. Um, as a partner there, I had the opportunity to lead a lot of quantum work and um, realized that for the first time in my career, I was really jealous of my clients. The folks like Yen, like Amir, like you know, the, the leaders in quantum were doing work that seemed not only more exciting and interesting, but much more important than anything I'd touched at any other point in my career. And I realized that I didn't want to be on the outside looking in. You know, I came to believe that quantum is going to be as important to the next 60 years of technology as the internet or the integrated circuit have been to the last 60, and that there was no world where as a consultant, I, I was at the heart of that. So the question then became, how can I make a difference in quantum, right? I'm, I'm not a physicist. My insights on physics or on algo design are, are not gonna be the key to increasing coherence time, reducing error rates, getting quantum to an era of you know, post-quantum advantage. Um, but what I realized interacting with leaders in quantum is that the tools they need to move quantum from experimental scale to you know, scaled solutions to people's problems, those were profoundly underdeveloped. And my background, both in engineering and uh, in business and understanding customer intent in designing for that could make a difference there. And so that's what Maybell is all about. It's improving the tools that physicists need to do quantum. Uh, we, we make the picks and shovels for, for the quantum gold rush that we're right at the beginning of. Yeah, great. And last but not least, of course, Christopher, how about you? Sure. Yeah, I have the uh, privilege of having been a colleague of uh, Ethan's in addition to being uh, an interviewee victim of the podcast. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. And, and thank you for the team here for having me. Um, uh, I am not a physicist. I'm a biophysicist. So I, I, I open up with that caveat, uh, or as some physicists would say, almost physicist, um, uh, or not really a physicist. Uh, but uh, my first uh, foray actually was coming out of academia um, to commercialize a technology that I had um, created when I was a graduate student, along with another graduate student, Pablo Koja, um, that became what you all know as the natural language and understanding engine that um, was used to develop Siri. Um, so I had that little experience uh, and uh, really had to move from uh, an academic environment uh, in which I, you know, my future was going to be doing academic medicine, writing papers, writing grants, uh, um, hiring postdocs and, 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 the, and whatnot. Um, and uh, I uh, had this uh, invention and had to find a way to commercialize it and uh, actually stepped out to do that. So uh, here I am uh, years later um, uh, doing this again, also with a technology that uh, some may claim is not ready yet. We're, we're at the very, very nascent stages of it um, with, with quantum. And uh, for me, it's kind of deja vu all over again, uh, in a sense, um, and a lot of fun. Uh, I, uh, Zapata, um, as you may know, uh, is a, uh, an offshoot of uh, Alanis Baravishik's lab at Harvard, where the first 
um, hybrid quantum classical uh, variational algorithm, VQE, that everyone knows and everyone has tried to implement uh, was invented. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, we took that intellectual property and, uh, and uh, some of the people who are left and who were not hired by Google and all the others uh, uh, in the industry and started this uh, company with my, uh, my co-founders. And uh, we've had the benefit of, because of that background, having invented variational algorithms, NISC algorithms, if you will, uh, the ability to um, hire up some of the best and brightest minds in the field. Uh, we now have over 100 employees. Uh, I would say half of the technical employees, most of them are technical, half of the, them are algorithm uh, people and the other half are software engineering people. And it's really that um, uh, interplay and cross-fertilization between um, the algorithmic side and the boring but very important software engineering <laughs> side of things that we do uh, at, at Fasada. And uh, I can say that uh, in gate model, um, gate model algorithms, uh, if you look at the, the patent field in that area, uh, we're sandwiched between IBM and Google and then everyone else. Um, so, you know, we have probably one of the stronger um, and actually the only really strong at that level independent um, software teams that doesn't make its own hardware. Um, so pretty proud of that. And I think it uh, creates a pretty unique position in the, in the field. Uh, to not have to claim that our qubits and our software are the best at the same time. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you all. And so I've seen some people trickling in after we've gotten started. So if you're just joining us, we're here to talk about entrepreneurship in the quantum space. So we've got this great panel of people. I'm Ethan, I'm going to be the host here. And um, before, we, before we go any further, I want to let everyone know that you can send questions to people and I will be, I will be getting those questions. You can do that. I believe both the YouTube live stream and the Discord are going to be monitored. So if you're going to send your questions, send them one of those two places. Awesome. So our next question, um, just real fast, I want to hear from everybody that I, I know a lot of people who have started companies, done anything in entrepreneurship, have a mentor or some mentor figures. And I'd like to, like, if you want to give a shout out to someone, um, now, now's your chance. And let's, let's go in reverse order. So Chris, you're up first. Yeah, I have so many over the years because I've come, I'm probably older than I look or old as I look. Um, uh, the you know there are many who have had a real pivotal um, uh, mentorship uh, role in my life. You know, um, one of I remember Russ Berg on the board of uh, Dejima, who was really uh, kind of the grumpy old man in the uh, room, uh, yelling at me and saying, you know, this, this is how you need to behave in a boardroom. When I was in my twenties, trying to be um, a CEO. Um, and uh, that was really helpful. Another one that comes to mind is uh, Ken Suzuki, formerly of Numero Research, who really got me to start my second company, GNI. Uh, and he eventually became uh, my CFO there. And we were partners from two people uh, through the business plan all the way up through um, uh, the IPO. Um, and really, his, uh, and Ethan, you've heard about this personally, uh, you know, he was uh, very instrumental uh, in my role. Um, uh, career in bringing, turning me on to um, value-focused thinking, really understanding what your values are, what you want to do, and then looking at the various alternatives that, that fit that um, worldview. And to me, that's been instrumental in being uh, directing me throughout entrepreneurship. A lot of the time, uh, when things are new in a field, you have this alternative, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And if you just look at the alternatives and try to compare, you'll get lost. And what Ken taught me um, uh, was that you really have to know what you want to do first. And then it makes filtering through all those various alternatives uh, very easy. And that's been instrumental for me in life and in, in, in entrepreneurship. Um, and I've got a couple of book recommendations I can send everyone uh, uh, for that as well. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, Corbin, how about you? Yeah, I mean, similarly, too many people to mention, but it's interesting because doing quantum physics in a research context, as I understand it from you know, my co-founders and team, it's highly focused, right? It's kind of you and math and engineering, keeping the math from behaving itself. And that's, that's the world you're working in, right? Building a quantum business is a whole lot more than the physics. Of course, it's a lot of physics and engineering, but it's also HR and supply chain logistics and sales and corporate culture and all these things. And there's nobody who's a world-class expert on all of those, right? So I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to turn to other BCG partners with expertise around all of those things, to investors, 
to scientific advisors like uh, ben Mazin or John Martinez at UCSB or uh, John Brisson at MIT, who have helped us on the kind of physics side of things, to one of my classmates from undergrad, who was a tech CEO a couple years ahead of me in his journey, and even my siblings and absolutely my, my spouse, um, I've benefited enormously from having a network around me willing to help me whenever I reach out. That said, to, to build Maybell, the most important relationship, no questions asked, has been my co-founders. You know, from both a scientific and business perspective, Maybell would not exist without Kyle Thompson and Brian Chu. Um, I do not make any decision of note, and I would not make good decisions if I didn't have them both challenge me, challenging me, building me up, filling my gaps, um, and, and making the company better. And so mentors take a lot of forms, but but that close in team of co-founders, you have to respect them and think of them as if, if you aren't finding co-founders who are smarter and better than you, you're not doing your job as a founder. And um, that holds true as the company scales and as you add employees to the team as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Amir, what about you? All right, so first I want to um, uh, totally agree with Corbin on, on the um, uh, co-founders Part, I think uh, having open discussions with the two co-founders, uh, in my case, my father and my uh, one of my best friends in the past 20 years uh, on everything from, from you know, defining a business model to hiring guidelines to everything uh, small and big in the company that's critical. I don't think there is one mentor outside of the company that can see things as clearly as, as we can. And, and having the different opinions is also critical and, and kind of being able to discuss them analytically. Um, I'd also mention one, uh, in, in Israel, there is really a huge ecosystem of like uh, startups, more mature companies, uh, SaaS companies, whole ecosystem. So I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by I'd say dozens of really experienced entrepreneurs, people that have built multi-billion dollar companies uh, or exited or IPO'd um, uh, recently and also a long time ago. And uh, I have this direct access to all these people. So uh, this, this network is something not everyone has, but for me, it's really, really important. And finally, uh, I think the, the one person that is a mentor more than anything else is our seed investor, Rana Khitouv. Uh, in the very beginning of the company, we were kind of pitching our idea and we were saying how we were going to reach $1 million ARR because that's what's needed for, you know, A round funding usually. And he said, no, 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 you got this all wrong. You're playing the completely diff a completely different game. Uh, we went with him, even though it wasn't the best financial terms we were offered, because he saw the long term vision, he saw how to play this aggressively, he um, sees the strategic parts of the quantum software business in a clearer way than I think most of the industry experts, and uh, his guidance took us a very long way and still today. Yeah, great. I think actually we're going to circle back on some of this later, but for, uh, before we do that, uh, let's go back to Dion. Any mentors you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, sure. Maybe also before I start talking a little bit to the audience, uh, just by the fact that everyone here says that they have a lot, I think it's super important. And I think there's some tricky part here, especially as many, I think also in the audience are scientists or physicists. Often we have the tendency to think, okay, we need to understand everything in all little detail ourselves and kind of go to, to all the nitty gritty details. And um, of course this can be done, but the problem is there's not enough time to do it. And often the problems that we deal with like company building, of course, I'm not saying this is easy, but this has been done many times before so there are people who went through the journey so i think just just a kind of uh, claim that i want to make is that be as open as you can to people who have done the, the stuff before and and give you advice don't listen blindly to everyone of course and 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 <laughs> follow blindly but um i think uh, with time you figure out who is really trying to help you or, or maybe who has a, a hidden agenda as well but I think as scientists, we a little bit are at risk of trying to 
be too much into all the de details. And I think having mentors, having people who advise you, this is super important if you want to stay efficient and on, on top of things. And for me, the person definitely uh, to, to name you was our first chairman, um, Axel Thierauf. He's a, a physicist himself uh, working, or he has a PhD in superconducting physics. So he really understood the problems from a technical point of view, but then he has built several companies himself. And he could kind of tell me, okay, usually with IP, for example, this is how you do it. This is how you build a filing strategy and all these topics. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel again there. Um, so he was really, I think for me, um, a super important person. We had almost daily phone calls in, in the beginning. Um, and um, I'm, I'm super thankful. Meanwhile, we have a different chairman who is also super helpful. Um, and I think this is also something um, as, a, as another, advice in, in different stages of the company, there can be different people who are who can be helpful for you because some um, are maybe better in building early, very early stage uh, companies. Some are maybe better when it goes towards IPO or so. So also, I think it's it's uh, not a bad thing sometimes to change the, the people you're, you're working with. Very interesting. Okay. Um, so I, I said we were going to circle back to this. Amir, you talked about finding the right investor. And so uh, this is a question that uh, I wanted to ask, which was, how do you find the, the right VCs? And let's, let's throw this to uh, Christopher first. Yeah, I think it goes back to, I encourage you to read the book. As I said, uh, it's, it's a, it'll give you a little insight into my thinking, um, which is not original, unfortunately. Uh, um, you know, what are your values as a company and what is the value you're going to bring as a company? Uh, understand that first. Understand what you need, uh, really, uh, in an in investor. And I would say in areas like quantum that are uh, deep tech, long journey, uh, you need uh, people who are going to be compatible with your values and, and, and what you're doing. And uh, this is difficult if you end up with investors who think they're going to flip something and have an IPO in a year. Uh, or, you know, um, sell you off uh, to, you know, a bigger player uh, in 18 months, um, because that's what they have to do um, based on the mandate of their fund. You know, they've got a couple of years left before they have to return their money to investors. Um, so they have to do that. Well, but if that's not your value system, if that's not what you want, if that's not what's good for the field or for your company, uh, that's not going to be an end well as a relationship. Um, so really, when we set out uh, to do this, we knew that this is going to be a journey. Um, we're talking about, in our case, being a software company uh, when the computers that we're writing software for are still in hobbyist mode. So put yourself in 1975 with the Altair and we're Microsoft, basically. That we knew going wide, eyes wide open into this, that that is it. Uh, there are gonna be 5,000 machines sold in the world at that time, you know, in 1975, that was it. That was the entire worldwide market for microcomputers. Um, but they started and they started actually not doing DOS or anything we know of. They, their first major product at Microsoft was, uh, was a, a card to do CPM software for Apple IIs, if anyone knows that. That was their biggest revenue producer in, uh, of $1.7 million in 1980. Um, so that's where we are right now. So if you're looking for an investor um, that's OK with that, uh, I think you'll end up OK uh, in, in quantum. But if your investors uh, misunderstand that we are not uh, in the PC revolution in the middle of you know, 1987, 1988, and, or we're going to be there in two years from now, uh, they're going to have the wrong idea. They're going to set the wrong expectations. They're going to ask you at a board level uh, to you once they get on your board to do some things that may not be in the best long-term interests of all the shareholders and, and your founders. So it's really important to get that impedance match uh, to be correct. Uh, and here in quantum, that means looking for uh, people who understand the field, understand the scientific challenges that we face, the reality of the timelines that we're dealing with, and still want to invest and still are excited because they get a chance to invest in potentially Microsoft or the IBM PC or something like that in 1976, okay? That's the opportunity. And so finding investors who will fit into that is challenging. And sometimes there are a lot of people say, give you, you know, the words of, yeah, 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 we believe in this. Yeah, 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 we're a long-term investor. Everyone's gonna say that, but do they really mean it? You have to look at their track record as well. So in our case, we were extremely, uh, um, lucky to have uh, folks like Pillar, folks like uh, The Engine, which comes out of MIT, which is deep tech focused, have that credibility. That's all they do. I mean, they're doing nuclear fusion as one of their other companies. 
Uh, and another fun prelude that has been uh, great uh, for us uh, who are invested in other uh, quantum companies, but they are an impact fund. So they're about making big picture changes uh, in, in the world. It comes from uh, Jim Simons and, and that group. So they are about you know big picture humanity changes and they're an evergreen fund and they're a one LP person. So they aren't looking to, to make their return necessarily tomorrow. They're going to make a return but it doesn't have to be tomorrow, next week, next year, two years from now. So I think trying to find those folks is really important and not people who are just riding the hype bandwagon. I think that could be really dangerous for um, uh, uh, expectations for, for the investors here in quantum. Yeah. Yeah, t totally. Uh, hype is a big problem. And uh, Mir, I see you smiling and, and nodding along to a lot of this. Does this, this resonates with you? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think I think setting the expectations right and seeing that investors understand what the quantum market is today. Um, and also, I would add on top of everything that I agree on that you need to have good communications, be able to talk very visibly, hopefully, you know, resonate on a sense that it's all that it's fun to talk to the person that he's a friend, especially on the seed stage, which I guess is relevant for most of the listeners here. You want someone that you're able to share the challenges with almost as a, another co-founder, at least in the early stages. That's something that is really important. You don't just want someone to put in the money and, and be content with, uh, with the pace. Yeah. And Corbin, maybe related to this a little bit, I, I want to ask about sort of the, the other side of this equation, right? There's the finding the right VCs who share your values. There's also having the right value proposition. Um, and how, how do you find that right value prop in order to get funded? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a battle, right? It, it may sound harsh, but your great idea only matters when customers agree that it matters. And no matter how strongly you believe in an idea, unless somebody's willing to pay for it, I can't make payroll for my quickly expanding team, right? Now, now that doesn't always mean that customers know what they want at the outset. Very often they don't. But your job as an entrepreneur is to listen to them, to understand them, to watch them, to identify problems that they care about that are making their lives harder and a solution that they're ultimately willing to pay for. I, I didn't set up about to start a company when I decided to jump ship from BCG and join Quantum. Um, I, I knew I wanted to be in Quantum, but it felt like the smart way to do that, especially with you know, a wife, kids, and a mortgage, was probably to join one of the companies working on Quantum already. Um, but I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of top physicists at these companies. And it was interesting because every conversation was wildly different, but almost every single conversation landed on at least two points for a while. The first was the physicists would explain with conviction and passion and true belief why their qubits were the best qubits, the most scalable, the most intelligent, the most you know, coherent, and how their path to scalable quantum made sense. And I'm not a quantum physicist, and these are unbelievably smart people, and they were all convincing. Right? The superconducting folks would say, you know, we've had 70 years refining the fab and there is no path to scale in quantum that doesn't lead through a fab because we know how to do this, we know how to do it well, and now it's really a question of architecture and details and we're getting there. And you know what? They're knocking down milestones quickly and showing real progress, and it's easy to believe that. And then the neutral atom or trapped ion folks will look you in the eye and they will say, you know, why are we building qubits? Nature's already given us perfect qubits. Every atom is inherently identical. It's crazy for us to try to use our muddy fists to create a qubit when, when you know, God made them for us, right? I have no idea who's right among that group. And they are way smarter than I am. But kind of right on the heels of that conversation about them having the best qubits, folks would talk about how the supply chain for the tools they need to build their qubits is a mess, uh, hugely expensive, unreliable, hard to use systems that sometimes they pay millions of dollars in wait years to get only to have you know, consistent problems with them once they're there. They have to design their infrastructure around the hardware that they depend on. And while I don't know how to build the best qubits, I could certainly be part of the solution on that hardware side of things. And once you've found a problem that really resonates with customers, 
the funding for us hasn't been that hard. I mean, I, I was able to show investors a 300 square foot tangle of tubes and wires that we're replacing with kind of a sleek set of 19 inch racks that you roll in, plug in, turn on, and they give you the cold volume you need for most qubit modalities. And it was easy for them to see why folks would want to buy our system. And so, you know, some investors care deeply about making the world a better place. Just about all of them care a lot about making money. When I'm able to look at an investor and say, you can fit four times more qubits in a tenth of the space without spending a penny more and using a fraction of the electricity over time, um, both investors and customers have gotten pretty excited about that. Yeah, yeah that, that's great. And I, I yeah, the, the next question here, um, before we start pulling some from the audience, this is one that I had prepared beforehand. Um, I want to throw to Jan, so get ready, um, which incidentally is the, the nature of the question, which is how do we go from tech readiness levels? Um, one, like, you know, you're just starting out, you're just exploring the space to three or four, where it's starting to be a prototype that you can start showing people and, and be ready to start commercializing. Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. And of course, these technology readiness levels, it's sometimes also a little bit hard to argue where, where we are exactly. But I think generally the point is, and I think this is also something that Corbin mentioned, is that we need to show progress. And I think also, as we are still in the very early stages, it's about creating trust among non-physicists, other communities, that actually the technology works and, and will work and that we are following the roadmap. So I think um, something that we as a community have to do is create roadmaps and then work on them um, to show actually that the technology is getting somewhere. And of course, there are many let's say open challenges. And, and one of them is that nobody really knows how big a system, let's say a quantum computer system needs to be to do something uh, meaningful commercially. So there are people who say maybe a few hundred qubits, others say millions because you need error correction. So you, you might have long arguments um, about this, but I think most importantly is that we say, okay, look, this is where we are today. This is where we are going to be next year and, and then work um, on, on those and uh, try to be, of course, as precisely as you, you can be with hitting the, the milestones. Of course, there can always be delay. People understand um, this. And then I think also build something that, that works. So this is pretty much the, the philosophy that, that we have at IQM is that we say, okay, at the moment we work with 20 qubit systems. Obviously you cannot create any commercial value like this with, with 20 qubits, but this doesn't mean that these systems are completely meaningless because you still can do a lot of great things with them. You can publish scientific papers, you can educate new talent. Um, so bring them out there. And, and this is what we do. So our business model actually is to sell the systems to scientific computing centers, research organizations and this makes also us as a company more quantum ready let's say because um, we figure out what are actually the specs that the customers want to see um, what are they happy with what not um, which kind of software do they want to use which we are for example not building ourselves so how can we integrate into this ecosystem so i think it's in the end um, it's not uh, kind of about numbers of technology readiness levels, but try to build something that works somehow as fast as you can, and then keep on improving it over time and follow your roadmaps. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, uh, Amir, can I'm I gonna... chime in for just a second, please. Um, yes. Which is agree 100% with everything that Jan said. Um, the other thing is, uh, Maybell as a company is really committed to getting folks access to hardware. If if the thing keeping you from proving that you're doing something novel and exciting is access to cold volume and the wires to make it happen, reach out to us because we have a hardware accelerator and we want to help people get there. Um, so either on our site or on your site, we can hopefully figure something out. Yeah, that's that's great to know. I'm sure that people will be, will be you're going to get a flood after this. <laughs> um, Amir, I wanted to ask you sort of the same question, um, but you know, we've heard now from, from Jan and a little bit from, from Corbin, that's more the hardware side. You're coming from the software side. Is there any different considerations that you need to be looking at, or is it pretty much the same? Have a roadmap, try to execute on it. So I think one of the fundamental differences between hardware and software is that in software, you're able to iterate a lot quicker. You can create like uh, almost continuous deployments of your uh, version. Uh, shipping it to someone is a matter of double clicking. 
um, and the feedback loops from customers are immediate. So uh, being able, so I agree 100% on, on, you know, on, on short iterations and working with uh, customers or users. Uh, and for us from day one, this is something that we're doing and you know, uh, we're, not, um, we're not trying to invent what we think in theory is uh, the most pressing challenges. We have our technology roadmap, but it's always going to be focused on what do users and customers need today because that's our way to iterate. And one more point I think that's also critical is that you're fundamentally limited by uh, your team when you're building technology. So if you're not going to bring the experts, in our case, we need the quantum experts and we need the classical design experts. I mean, the, the design technologies that we're building upon are things that have been built for 70 years in the classical world. And also the software architects that can build an enterprise production grade product uh, that's actually working and doesn't need to be refactored once every six months, but uh, is, is built architecturally correct. If you don't have people that are experts in these fields, you're not going to be able to build a high quality product or technology. So I would say, of course, on day one, you don't necessarily have the right team, but never ever compromise on you know, uh, bringing the right people that have the expertise into the team that will be a long-term liability and, and limit how, how deep and fast you can go. Yeah, I, I wanna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a pause from asking questions and I'm gonna talk for myself for a little bit because I've been asked by the Womanium organizers to do that. Um, and I'm gonna tie a couple things together. So Christopher talked a little bit about, uh, well, maybe a lot about value focused thinking and making sure that what you're doing aligns with values. And um, Amir, you, you helpfully brought up the fact that in software, you've got these faster cycle times. And so uh, it's just a couple, couple piece of it, pieces of advice that I can give, even with my limited knowledge and experience that I've had, is that you know, getting real world experience is very important for, like, for finding out what your values are and what you do enjoy. Um, and sometimes you don't find like exactly what you want to do with an experience, but it helps you narrow down like, oh, I've, uh, for instance, I had an internship um, in the past, not, not this one, but in the past. And the sort of the main takeaway that I got from it was one, I, I really do like software. And two, I don't want to have a one hour commute like both ways. I, I want to have, I want to work somewhere closer to home. Right. And, and that was, that was really good experience. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, make sure you, you know, like what you want to do. Um, and the best way to find that out is to actually get out there and start doing stuff. Um, and part of the reason I, I said that I was going to bring this in the, the short cycle times with software, um, from the time I was six years old until I turned about 16 ish, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. I was not good. I, like quantum computing was not really on my radar. Um, and then I took some engineering classes where we actually did like hands-on engineering work in high school. And I found out at least the, the, the aerospace engineering, it was aer aerospace engineering classes, was a lot of paperwork. And I didn't like that. Um, I like to move fast and break things. And, you know, if you move fast and break things with aerospace engineering, a rocket blows up and three people die. But if you move fast and break things with software, you get those fast cycle times and you get to learn more. And so, yeah, that's something that I learned about myself. And I wouldn't have had that without the experience of doing something that I ended up not liking and finding out what I, what I actually did like. So that, that's, that's my advice, a little bit of my, my backstory. Um, and now I'm going to go back to asking questions because I, I prefer that. So uh, we've had a question. <laughs> what was that? Thanks for sharing that. That's a great story. And it's great advice as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got a question from someone here in the USA for Chris, um, which is, why did you decide to enter quantum computing with your biophysics background? And um, what do you think about the potential of quantum biology? Yeah, so uh, 
actually, uh, when you say biophysics, it's structural biology, mostly what I was doing. And MR, I mean, physical uh, uh, work, which is quantum chemistry at the end of the day, when you're looking at um, intermediate states and binding and this kind of thing. So at the end of the day, it's quantum mechanics, uh, just applied quantum mechanics. Uh, so in some ways, I'm cheating saying that I'm just a biologist going to quantum, uh, doing quantum chemistry and, and having a background in DFT and molecular dynamics and these kinds of things, both classical and, and uh, quantum mechanical uh, chemistry gives you the background, the math, and, and, and really, in some ways, uh, more so than just straight physicists, in some way, uh, understanding uh, the practical implications and the practical application of some of the uh, theory um, that we use uh, in, in, uh, in this field. So it wasn't coming in completely naive. So um, uh, if you were just a biologist without the, the quantum mechanic background, I think it might be a little bit more difficult. You do need to have, I think, in this field to really understand what you're doing, some basic quantum mechanics uh, to really understand the differences between what you're doing classical computationally and what you're doing um, uh, as far as for problem formulation in, in setting up an algorithm, what you're trying to do, the differences, because classical statistics and quantum statistics are different. You need to know that, and you need to know that well. You don't have uh, uh, negative probabilities in, in classical uh, uh, math and, and, and in physics. So uh, having said that, um, uh, I think the application of some of the areas that we had in biology, particularly in systems biology, uh, are, were one of the reasons that inspired me to come into this field because we were hitting a wall in everything I did. So I did a lot of gene regulatory network uh, work. That's uh, one of my um, strongest fields. Uh, and that was a lot of Bayesian uh, statistical work uh, on uh, uh, mapping problems. And these are NPR and B-complete types of problems that we had, you know, 10,000 by 10,000 genes in a matrix with uh, uh, 256 data points uh, of uh, interactions among those and trying to actually describe the uh, interaction of that entire network. That is computationally hard. And that is what systems biology is. And then you have genes and proteins and everything else. So the computational difficulty, we actually, uh, back in the day, uh, mid uh, uh, 2000s, uh, blew up a Linux cluster like black smoke, um, literally black smoke at the University of Tokyo trying to do our calculations. So that difficulty of biology uh, to in the computations of some of the stuff that we have to do, both on the chemistry side, ab initio chemistry, and then systems biology, and then clinical data, trying to understand that these are really hard computational problems that uh, many things that we will use uh, quantum computers as a co-processor to do will help us to do better a better job with that. And that will have a great impact. Now, quantum biology, if we use that term, that means something different. That's, you know, quantum effects in biology, like birds, migratory patterns, and this kind of thing. I think it's interesting as an academic thing, but that's probably less relevant to this co uh, conversation, which is about applying quantum computing uh, and using quantum mechanics to do computation and applying that to biological problems that are computationally complex. Nice. Unless there are any other biophysicists on the call, I'm gonna move on to the next question. <laughs> um, so the next one, actually, this is a really, really good question from someone in Italy. Um, I'm, I'm ashamed that I didn't come up with this one myself, but let's assume that we have the right co-founders, the right network, the right mentors, all of that. Do we have to then show a working product in order to catch the interest of a VC? And I'm going to throw this one to Amir first. Yeah, that's a really short answer. The answer is no. Um, don't don't wait. Um, of course, maybe you'll get a better financial terms if you're uh, going to have a working product. But personally, I think that if you have the right value proposition and uh, you have a clear path on how you're going to execute it. And I'm not saying take like lightly on the plan. You need to have a plan. You need to know who the people you're going to hire, what is your strategy, what is your business model, what are you planning to achieve to raise your A round and your B round, and what's your end goal for the company, et cetera. You need to be very clear on that. But I think executing on the product, I wouldn't invest the time doing that with one or two co-founders as technical as they can be, I would take you know, some initial funding and build something uh, with leverage that uh, scales faster and be able to iterate without uh, you know, doing it in my garage with two people if I have the chance. 
and it's usually not necessary as well. Um, it, you, you, you'll be much more uncertainty is on your ability to execute on a long-term company vision than if you're able to build some initial POC with uh, two or three working hands. Yeah, is, does anyone else want to comment on this? Because I think it's a really good question. Can I? I, yeah. I like that better than the biophysics question. Um, <laughs> uh, not, not that that's not that relevant. But um, I, I think if your idea is get a working product in quantum, uh, with quantum computers doing something useful, you're not going to do that. So understand that uh, from the beginning. Like we're talking about 20 qubits, 30 qubits. There is nothing you can do mathematically with that thing uh, that's going to produce value in the marketplace today. Period. Full stop. Let's just say it. Um, okay. Uh, 20 qubits. Now, the formulation of those problems may give you working software systems using matrix product states or something else that's a, uh, bigger and equivalent in using classical hardware to do something useful. So let's also put that aside. But then why, why, why get started? I think it comes back to uh, the, the analogy of where we were in 1976. Uh, if I could give you uh, one little anecdote from that time, I, I, I looked it up. Uh, the most downloaded software um, uh, um, uh, in 1976, I believe, uh, was and a download meant buying a physical magazine and typing it in in basic, okay, uh, uh, or assembly or whatever it was. In this case, I think it was uh, uh, basic uh, on the uh, Altair. The, the most famous Altair thing that they was graphing a, a, a two variable problem, x and y axis, drawing a line. That was it, okay. Was that useful? Could you do anything with that? No, there were already uh, uh, computers, mainframes and everything that did some pretty cool math, like bringing us to the moon and everything already, you know, uh, 20 years earlier, uh, 10 years earlier. So, uh, but the fact that you could work on that and build the software that, that's going to eventually be running Excel spreadsheets in every company in the world was an opportunity. So I would, I would you know, try to change your framework in this particular field to where am I going to create value that's on that trajectory to where the, the, the hockey puck or the soccer ball is going, not where it is now. Uh, and you need to have that vision. You need to be able to articulate that, how I'm going to use what I'm creating, particularly on the software side with these nascent machines, that's going to make me the Microsoft, the Oracle, whatever that is, uh, five, 10 years from now. Yeah, the one other thing I'd add is identify as early on as possible what the steps along that journey are that show that you are succeeding, that show that you are delivering the value that you expect to deliver in the long run, and time your funding around those steps, because you can raise a fair bit of money pretty quickly, but you'll give up a whole lot of the company. And as a founder, having more equity in the company and more control of the company uh, is a huge benefit. And so if you can say in the next 12 months, I'm going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And I know that when I do that, my product is going to be more credible, more valuable. And, you know, my valuation is going to be a lot higher, raise enough money to get you there and not much further, you know, realize that everything's going to take longer than you think that there's lots of risk along the way that your estimates are going to be wrong, but, but don't over raise early, or you're going to find yourself far down the road with you know, the, the core founding team and the employees that made it happen, owning a little bit and the investors owning a whole lot. And uh, it's, it's nice if you can avoid that. Let me, Ethan, if that's okay, I have, uh, I think the first disagreement of the, of, uh, of, of the day, I'm not a hundred percent disagreement, <laughs> but at least I'll share uh, maybe a different perspective here. I think if you're waiting at each point, for example, till the end of your runway for the money to raise in optimal terms for the next stage, you're doing it not as aggressive as you should. Uh, some of the game here is that uh, we have this groundbreaking breaking technology uh, that has so much to do in very little time. And if you're not going to do it, someone else is going to do it. And the money in the end, it's not just the valuations and the equity, it's also your ability to execute. It allows you to bring more people and devote more resources to what you're going to do. And in the end, you're going to build a larger company faster. So that also needs to take into account. And 
sometimes I would trade off, you know, owning a little bit more of, of the equity uh, to kind of uh, make more ag aggressive execution. Um, it's kind of weights and balances here. Yeah, I would add that I agree in some ways with both sides. And, and here's where I would uh, kind of thread the needle. Um, you need to raise enough money to get really smart people to build what you're going to build ahead of when it's built. Otherwise, you'll lose the competition who are doing exactly that because there will be people with aggressive amounts of money going and getting all the smart talent. And we are in a talent war here. Um, so to, to be able to do it quickly and fast, you have to do that. Um, but it's about how you spend the money. You know, uh, if your engineers are flying first class to conferences and, and, and staying at the best hotels and whatever, and, and you think the money is endless because you raised $50 million, that money is going to disappear very quickly. Um, so it's, it's important to get the right people, but have them spend money in a way that's responsible and being good stewards of that capital. Um, and I think if you do that and you do space out your milestones that you're going to produce value at certain stages where you can prove it, at least internally, if not as a product that people are buying yet, uh, then, then that's what's important. It's about the priorities of how you spend the money and, and who you spend that money on. Getting a bunch of marketing consultants and blah, 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 blah before you even have a product that has product market fit, not the right way. Um, to do things. So raising money for the sake of raising money and making yourself look like a company that's more mature in the mar market fit category is where a lot of people fall down and make a mistake. You know, big adver advertisements, Super Bowl commercials and blah, 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 spending money on that when you still don't have an alpha product ready is, is really dumb. We don't want another Nicola. Ethan, I might just uh, jump in here because I had a question for the founders here. Before you, all of you came in, we had a VC panel with uh, Jan from InQtel, David Dorsey, and other investors. And my question to you all is, what is your advice to venture capitalists and funders in this domain? What would you say? And uh, you know, not, not a lot of uh, AVCs understand the quantum space. And also, I think, Chris, you mentioned the engine, right? And I was just with the engine folks two weeks ago. They're very patient capital. They're in it for the long term. So what is your advice? Or what is your ideal funder and, and venture capitalist? Do you so, mean I mean, VCs are going to have their own mission, vision, timeline, and I don't want to advise them on that. But if you're going to play in quantum, coming in with a level of honest humility and recognition of what you know and what you don't, I think is really important. I was on the phone with somebody a while back, and uh, he told me with conviction that he had decided that neutral atoms were the way to go. And that's great. He might be right. Neutral Atom Tech has done some really interesting stuff, but there's no way any of us can know that now. And definitely not somebody with a finance background from Bain. And like coming in, if you're investing in quantum, you need to be investing for the long haul. And you need to understand that we are at the beginning of a journey that we don't know what the future looks like. And if you want to be part of that, then you have the chance to do what Christopher has described, invest in the Microsofts of the world in 1975. That's incredibly exciting. But uh, this, this is a very long road ahead in quantum before we get to a world that's been fundamentally altered by quantum. I'd add on that. I think um, uh, investors need to find different metrics to uh, evaluate quantum computing companies today. Uh, revenues or multiples or ARR are not uh, really relevant. And the one thing that's relevant is that first you need to believe that quantum has the potential to revolutionize the digital world. And then you're saying, okay, so in, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now, we're gonna have this huge uh, market, potentially world changing many trillions of dollars. Is this company, does this company have the potential to be large there? And are, is, is their vision and their execution capabilities giving them a fair shot at being a large player when that happens? And then kind of, okay, so um, uh, try to evaluate the company uh, 10 years uh, before this happens uh, with all of the risk factors on execution or on the market is slow or on just you had bad luck. But that would be, I think, the only way for you to realistically kind of evaluate and, and put a price tag on a quantum company. Revenues 
or any of the other traditional methods really don't mean a lot right now. I'd agree. And I'd, I'll also say that, you know, you have to differentiate between whether you're going to be a hardware investor or a software investor. Uh, and there are different considerations uh, uh, for that. If you're going to go into hardware, you better get smart really quick and have some really technical people. This is semiconductor investing at the end of the day, if you wanted to create an analogy with the classical world. Um, there are not a lot of semiconductor investors who are successful who are not extremely deep, uh, at least in their advisory boards and who they're talking to, uh, to, to really understand architectures. Uh, because uh, each architecture has its own flavors and, and how you execute on that matters a lot. And, and trying to figure that out as a finance person or whatever, you're not going to get there. Period. Full stop. You know, uh, semiconductor analysts on Wall Street do semiconductors and have semiconductor physics backgrounds uh, uh, before they become financial analysts. Uh, they get their MBAs later. Right. So semiconductor and trying to choose because you have to choose a horse. That's the thing. Not just semi uh, superconducting qubits, you have to say, OK, which one? Uh, and, and that's a hard choice to make uh, and, and a difficult one and one that's very capital intensive. The software side, um, I, I think the consideration is a bit different. In some ways, if you choose software, you're kind of choosing uh, uh, an index fund uh, investment strategy because if any of these things work, that there will be a software ecosystem out there for them. We know that, right? We know that from history. Um, so in some ways, software is a safer bet, but what are you going to do within software? Uh, you really need to be a good software investor and understand where the software market is. If you think this is consumer, you know, uh, uh, iPhone apps, that's not, the, that's not what we're doing. We're doing high-end uh, supercomputing. That's what it is, high-performance computing or coprocessors or the NVIDIA world of software, right? So CUDA, that kind of thing, and a whole compiler tool chain that you have to understand. And now you have to understand, okay, what are you trying to do in that ecosystem? It, you know, you look at the compiler tool chain and when we're just doing pulse control or we're just doing some piece of compiling or cross compiling or transpiling, um, uh, those may be features and not companies at the end of the day. So I think that there, there, there needs to be caution about, okay, we're gonna create the Microsoft of, uh, of, of quantum computing, uh, but really what we're doing is uh, uh, circuit design or we're doing uh, uh, cross compiling or, or intermediate representation, uh, classical quantum uh, stuff that's really down to the inner loop of uh, hybrid quantum classical computing. That may be a feature or even a firmware in, inside a hardware company like NVIDIA, CUDA, CUDA is software, right? They have even libraries for, for doing uh, machine learning. It, is that a separate standalone company? I don't know. I would say I doubt it. Um, so I think as an investor, you really need to understand what high performance computing is about, what the customers are about, and where the software uh, wins can be in that ecosystem uh, to really do well in this area. So I know we're, we're coming up on the end of our time here. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question. And then while the panelists think about it, I'm going to say a couple thank yous. So the question is, what is your favorite like law? Um, so my, for, for me, that would be it could be Moore's law, something that you can say like in a sentence. For me, that would be 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the results. That, that's my favorite. So you you guys think about that. And I'm going to say some thank yous. First of all, thank you to our incredible panelists. You've all been fantastic. I've learned a lot myself. I know that everyone else here has. Um, thank you to also the, everyone who's watching and who's been submitting questions. There have been excellent questions. I know I haven't gotten to all of them. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone who has put those in. And then also thank you to all of the Womanium organizers for putting this together, doing all the work behind the scenes to actually make this happen. Um, so yeah, let's let's hear from our panelists what their favorite laws are. Uh, Jan, let's start with you. All right, uh, I go maybe with the law of surprise, uh, which is something as a founder you always get because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you always have to give it a try. And I think this is the spirit that, that you need to just do it and then see what comes out. Great. All right, Corbin. I think the second law of thermodynamics, like entropy is everything. And it doesn't matter whether you're building a company or uh, trying to drive coherence time on a qubit. If you aren't actively removing entropy from the system, like chaos is catching up with you and you need to have a plan for how you're going to do that. All right. Uh, Amir. 
So I like the bike shed effect, or I like to keep that in mind and uh, bike shed effect and try to avoid it. It's uh, one of, I think, Parkinson's, Parkinson's law about um, how you're designing a billion dollar power plant, but half the discussion goes on the budget of the bike shed that's near the power plant. And I think you need to constantly uh, make sure you're focusing on the big picture and what really matters and let go of some of the details, even if you're more of an expert on the details, they matter less than the high level strategy. And we're not very good at humans from differentiating between what we're good at and what's important. Thanks. And Christopher, last one. Well, yeah, the uh, scientists here will hate me for also being a lawyer, but um, uh, that, that kind of drives some of my thinking uh, when, when I have some really tough decisions to make. And it's uh, really uh, the law of when in doubt, don't. <laughs> well, great. Thank you all so much um, for, for coming, for, for tuning in. Um, I, I don't know, Prachi or Marlu, did you want to say any final words um, at the end here? Yeah, well, thank you all for joining and sharing with us your advice and your journeys of, uh, of uh, yeah, being CEOs, being founders in the quantum space. Super grateful, looking forward to working with all of you. I know students have a lot more questions as well, so we'll send them to you. Uh, but thanks again for a fantastic uh, panel today. Uh, Malu, anything from you? Yeah, all right. Thanks, Ami. Thanks, Sian. Thanks, Chris and, and Corbin as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, Bye. all. Bye. Bye, all. All right, um, for, for those of you still here, just some, some items from you. I know you're all focused on your hackathon for the next few weeks. Do make sure you're in touch with your, your mentors, be active on the hackathon channels. Uh, the, the other update I have to give to you is, uh, yeah, hackathon is, is a lot of fun. The other update I have to give to you is we are having Bill Phillips here next week. That's August 18th, it's absolutely confirmed. Uh, he'll be on their, uh, he'll be on a special Zoom link, uh, special link. So we are going to send that over to all of you. Uh, but be excited, be ready, August 18th, and we'll have Bill, Bill Phillips over. Uh, Malu, any other items you should cover? Yes, take this, check the schedule, put everything in your calendar. On Monday, there will be Unitary Fund, and then indeed Thursday, a true highlight, Nobel Prize laureate William D. Phillips will be here to have a Q&A with us. And you will also have the opportunity to send your questions in advance and during the session. In the meantime, work with your team, work with the mentors, make great progress. And this weekend, we will also compile the list for QSilver and the hardware and send it to you probably early upcoming week. So then you will have your second and third certificate of this program. Congratulations to so many of you. Yeah. Wonderful having you again today. Yeah, maybe, maybe everything's happening so quickly. I'll say one more thing. Uh, career fair. I know a lot of you asked uh, questions or are curious as well. We have another career fair with, with IQM, with so many other amazing partners. Actually, over 22 companies are part of it. We want you to go. We want you to go fully prepared. So, you know, get your Q bronze, Q silver in. Uh, prepare your pitch. I, we got amazing feedback that the pitch session was really helpful. So start preparing your pitch as well. Again, how you introduce yourself is is like 90% of the impact. And the rest is, you know, make sure you have good lighting, you're wearing business clothes. Uh, of course, the other thing is have a resume ready. If you haven't uploaded it already on Canvas, make sure it's uploaded. Um, that career fair will be open to some of the new people who join for the hackathon and for our existing participants. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and prepare, prepare, prepare. And also, you know, by the time of this career fair, you will have your... Um, your GitHub repo that you can go and show your portfolio to companies and say, well, this is an interesting problem solved and I'm able, you know, with the team, I'm able to solve it really well. So uh, yeah, keep that in mind as well. Hope your, your hackathons are going well. There were some questions from everyone who joined the hackathon and were not in the program before about these certificates. The answer is as follows. The first requirement for the career fair is having either Q bronze or Q silver by Q world or another equivalent certificate. This can be qubit by qubit, it can be participation in an IBM summer school, it can be being a Qiskit advocate. We, we ask you to upload such proof. Uh, but this can really be many, many types of uh, certificates and activities. Looking forward to you uploading it. 
And then second, upload your resume, take part in the pitch training session. All right, Raj, anything from you? Yes, uh, about today's session itself. Along with working on your projects for the hackathon, along with learning about quantum computation, the hardware, the software, everything, we also want you to focus on the ideas that change the world and the people that change the world. Because ultimately we want you to be one of those people who has good ideas that change the world. And that is why even in our name, we have got STEM and then we also have entrepreneurship. And today we brought a panel of entrepreneurs who had started their companies, who are spearheading the field of quantum computing into the future. Whether it is in hardware, whether it is in software, or whether it is in dilution refrigeration, or whether it is a combination of all that. And on top of that, if we had a moderator for the panel who is actually very young, and he is already in the industry, he's already doing fantastic stuff, and he also has got a bright future ahead of you. And we want you to go back and listen to everything that the speaker said, because what they're sharing are gems of wisdom based on their direct experience. It is very different from reading about business or startups in a book. When you actually do it, you go through a journey and you learn lessons and ex from your experience, which is much more valuable than anything that you can read in a book or learn in a classroom. And one of the goals of Vonium programs is to take you out of the classroom, take you out of the textbooks and put you in the real world with real problems, with real companies, with real CEOs, with real challenges, including our hackathon challenges, which are provided by real companies facing those exact real problems. Some of these challenges are real challenges provided by the companies. So we want you to think about the entire cohort of speakers who came not only today, but also before, but also learn from the lessons that were shared today. And we want you to keep that entrepreneurial mindset all the time as you try to solve problems. So keep that in mind. And coming back to the topic of career fair, always come prepared. And one of the things that Prashi mentioned about coming prepared is extremely important. And also I want to add that pretty soon Womanium team will also be hiring. So even though we may not be present in the career uh, competing with the other companies, our team is also hiring for the quantum programs, both for the quantum computing, but also for the future quantum sensors and quantum metrology, but also for other programs that Womanium is doing, everything from satellite, satellite testing, artificial intelligence, biology of aging, et cetera. So there are a lot of opportunities. Stay tuned and always good luck with everything. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Well, then it's time to close this session. We will answer some further questions on Discord. Have a great weekend, everyone. Maybe see some of you in the happy hour on Sunday and happy hacking in the meantime. Thank you. Bye, y'all.